He is a New York Times opinion writer and author of the book, Why We're Polarized. Ezra Klein, welcome. Glad to be here. So I was very excited to talk to you. Uh, I'm trying to institute a new policy where I read the books before the conversations. Uh, implemented, I would say, um, uh, not faithfully. First of all, I really recommend to everybody listening that they read the book. I feel there's your book, there's uh, Adam Gentleson's book, Kill Switch, about the Senate. There's Heather McGee's book, The Sum of Us. And I feel like there's almost like a kind of um, unified field theory of how America is broken, who broke it, and how we can fix it. And I and I feel like there's a lot of, uh, uh, and your book is part of that. So I want to start just sort of stepping back. What is your definition of polarized? When you say we're polarized, what? who is polarized from what what does it mean? Thank you for asking that. That's super important. So polarization, polarized, just means clustered around two poles. That is it, right? It's like, it's a, it's a concept from magnets. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I say we're polarized, I do not mean we're disagreeing or we're disagreeable. I don't mean people are pissed off. I just mean that our, and, and political scientists mean, and whoever is using this term correctly just means that our disagreements or some important feature, our policy opinions, our attitudes are structured around like two groups. And, and let me explain quickly what is the alternative to that. So for a long time in American history, we had these very, very broad political parties that had the Democratic Party had really conservative Southern racists in it, and it had, you know, liberal, you know, um, Northern Democrats in it. And this was not a period of time in America where we didn't have very sharp disagreements. I mean, National Guardsmen were shooting student protesters in the streets. We had riots. We had the Civil Rights Movement. We had, like, the Vietnam anti-war movement. There was a huge amount going on. But because the d disagreements weren't structured by parties, we would not say they were polarized. We were just disagreeing with each other. Um, now what's going on is that our disagreements are really well sorted by our parties. Republicans and Democrats are ideologically different. They're really demographically different. They're religiously different. And as each one of these like new dimensions of difference aligns around a party, we become more and more polarized. One, one aspect of this that I found a fascinating way into this moment in politics is the nationalization of our identity. And I and I when I was reading it, I was thinking, oh, that applies to me. Right. And and the, the way that I thought about it is that, like, I think, what why am I an American? Well, what what does it mean to me to be an American? It has to do with values. Like, what is it? What does New York mean to me? It's about restaurants. Right. Like there's this <laughs> that that we associate values with the country and geography, beautiful mountains with where we're from. Can you talk a little bit about how we've moved away from caring about our states, our communities, our sort of local governance. Yeah, I love that you picked up on this. It's one of my favorite pieces of the book. So this is coming from a book by, I believe it's one of the, there are like a hundred political scientists named Dan or Dave Hopkins. Um, and so it's by a Dan or Dave Hopkins, uh, a book called These Increasingly United States. And he shows that when you ask people to explain what underlies their different geographic identities, um, so their, their identity is American, as you say, it'll be values. Like, what does it mean to be American? Why are you proud to be an American? Freedom, uh, liberty, you know, prosperity, whatever it is. Why are you proud to be a Californian or a San Franciscan or, you know, somebody from Missouri? People begin turning to geographic features. I love the coastline. I, I like the mountains. I like the plains. I like the, you know, like the, 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 the local landmark. I like the sports team. And one of the things he's proving in that book across a huge range of different experiments and, and, and research is that over a long period of time, we used to have much stronger state and local identities. Uh, so, so here's one of my favorite little pieces of data from that book. He went back and, and there are these ways of looking at text in, in books going a long way back, digitized text. And he looked and compared how often did you see I'm a X, where X could be, you know, a, Cal a state identity, Californian, New Yorker, Vermont, you know, Missouri, whatever, um, versus I'm an American. And early in American history, uh, this goes back and forth for a really long time. Um, sometimes you have more state identity uh, expressions, sometimes a little bit more national, but, but often more state. And then it's around World War II and its aftermath that national identity like goes vertical and never looks back. And the reason this is actually important to the polarization story is the American system of government is set up under the idea that our primary attachments are going to be to our local spaces. I think it's Madison who says that, um, who, who says that the, the local identity will always and everywhere be, be the primary identity. And the entire system is built like that. So we have, you know, we elect members of Congress through districts. The Senate balances different states against each other, which makes sense if you think the key thing you're doing is balancing the powers of big and small states. 
But now our primary political identities are, are, are nationalized political parties. And, and the way I always say it is this, imagine that there was a vote tomorrow as there should be, to make D.C. a state. Will Vermont and Wyoming vote together because D.C. is going to be a small state and is going to add to the small state caucus, and Texas and New York vote together because like, they want big states to retain their power? Or will New York and Vermont vote together because those are liberal blue states, and Texas and Wyoming will vote together because they're conservative red ones? And like, obviously, you know what the answer is. So in a million different ways, there, were, there was a theory of how American government would work, which is that first and foremost, we would have representatives um, representing our particularistic geographic interests, and that would reduce party polarization and other kinds of, of, of factionalism. But instead, we don't. And over time, we've done everything we possibly can to nationalize politics from the way media has evolved all the way down to getting rid of earmarks, which now may be coming back under the Democrats. But that was just one more way of weakening uh, the, the local poll on politics. So everything becomes this headline red-blue collision as opposed to this this you know issue of um, – uh, of what your city needs. And, and I'll just say, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but but I, you and I were both there when this was happening. The Ben Nelson, Nebraska kickback, Cornhusker right. kickback thing during Obamacare was just like the most amazing example of how politics had changed, where like Nelson did exactly what you were supposed to do in American government and just got flayed for it. I, I want to ask you about that too, because so just so people understand that, that the way... The way Obamacare worked is uh, states were going to get a bunch of money to expand Medicaid. Uh, and Ben Nelson, who was a conservative Democrat senator from Nebraska, he negotiated a special deal in which Nebraska just got a better split than other states. Now, this is something that you would want your senator to do. If you were a Republican Democrat, You it was more money coming in to Nebraska and he got killed. It was called the Cornhusker kickback. Uh, he was doing something dirty to get Obamacare done uh, and uh, it ended up becoming a huge liability for him, even though what he was doing was trying to get the best deal for his state. Yeah, and I'll add just two things to that. So one, Ben Nelson was like the Joe Manchin of our generation. <laughs> you know, so he's from Nebraska. I think he was, he was the most conservative Democrat in the Senate at that point and he was going to be the crew 60th vote on, on Obamacare if it, you know, if, if, if he voted for it. And so Nelson had this like very interesting political dilemma, which is Nebraska is a red state. Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, was not popular there. Ben Nelson was a Democrat. He ultimately did want to vote for it as a whole. And so like, what do you do? He did some things I really didn't love, like got rid of the public option. Um, but then he did the thing that is supposed to be the way you handle this problem, which, as you say, you use your leverage as like the the key Democrat from the red state to get your state all this money. And so just the, the, the quick version of it is Medicare is usually about a 60-40 federal state match under the Affordable Care Act. It was 100 percent federal for the first three years and a 90-10 after that. And um, basically, the federal government said, you know what, or, or, or the Democrats said, Nebraska just gets 100 percent the whole way through. This is worth a <laughs> right. lot of money to a state like Nebraska. What's crazy about it is that they end up taking it out of the bill in part because of the popular Republican governor of Nebraska, like, you know, rails against it. And so Nebraska, like, just doesn't get this money. And the reason this is an important story for our politics generally is it one way you can reduce, like, all of your opinions clustering around just this big red-blue divide is that you can give people sort of local needs they can put first and give people ways to survive in a state that maybe doesn't always agree with them, but because they're really good at delivering for the state, right? Because they're really good at bringing pork back, as we, as we began to call it, to their state, because they're good at getting things done. But if then you begin to say transactional politics is dirty— Right. That you making deals on behalf of your district or your state is dirty. It's earmarks. It's pork. It's corruption. And like the only pure way to be in politics is to be like a hardcore ideologue who believes in right. everything your national party believes in. Then again, everything lines up around this, you know, this this red blue polarization. And and we can talk about all this, but the problem is not even that red blue polarization is in and of itself bad. It's that we have a political system and institutions, and this is a very crucial part of, of my story that I think people often miss, that is not built to work in that polarization. You can have a political system where there's lots of polarization and you get things done and that's fine. That isn't the system we've built. So we now operate with a party system at cross purposes with our political institutions. And so, you know, a lot of things that need to get done don't get done. And a lot of things that um, do get done are bad. Right. Like you can imagine a 50-50 system where like a parliamentary system, they get power, they get to use their power. If they are successful, they get more time. If they are not successful, they get routed at the next election. So do you see something different playing out right now on this question of 
party identity over local identity around COVID relief. Obviously, we just had a vote where every single Republican in the House voted against COVID relief, yet they did so in opposition to a lot of local Republican officials, a lot of state officials, a lot of local officials who want this money, who say we need the state and local money. It's not a blue state bailout. We need the money. So I'd like to hear what you think on this, because I think what the Biden administration is doing here is really interesting. So what they're saying is that unity is defined as Republicans and Democrats in polling supporting the bill, not Republicans in Congress voting for the bill. And weirdly, that actually is a way of depolar of, of, of understanding politics in a less polarizing way. There is in among political scientists, among people who study this, this huge endless debate about what they call mass polarization versus elite polarization. How polarized are just voters in terms of what they believe and how they feel versus how polarized are the people in Congress, people in the media, et cetera. And you can go a lot of ways with debate, but the, the simple finding is like elites are way more polarized than the public, particularly on policy. Um, the public is actually open to a lot of different approaches on policy. And the thing they do is trust their leaders to tell them what is the right approach. But, you know, Donald Trump can walk out. You know, Paul Ryan was the standard bearer of the Republican Party a couple of years ago. And then one day Donald Trump walks out and is like, actually, we should should do $2,000 checks and $2,000 checks become a lot more popular among Republicans. There's a lot of movement um, uh, that is possible among among the mass public in, in terms of what policies would make sense. So then the question becomes like, who are you trying to make a deal with? And the Biden administration is basically the way they are trying to frame this is that they are trying to make a deal with what Republicans want, not with what Republican national politicians want. And True or not true, like you can sort of argue the almost like semiotics of this, but it's a, I think, a more correct way of thinking about the question. One of my like endless frustrations with Washington is centrism is defined as choosing whatever is in the middle of the Senate. As opposed right. to what is in the middle of public opinion, as opposed to what it is people want. So you endlessly have these like, quote unquote, moderates or centrists who have unbelievably unpopular opinions, who are in fact much more radical than people who are considered more ideological actors in politics who have actually come up with popular positions. And and that's, I think, been a very perverting thing on the on the system. I just saw a report yesterday that every morning, every single morning, Joe Manchin has a staffer text him the number of the national mm-hmm. death that day. And I think that's supposed to be some centrist aesthetic. That is not how like anybody in this country thinks about politics or their lives. It's an incredibly extreme and unusual way to think about the national debt, about American politics. Um, mm-hmm. Annie Lowry, my partner, was, was te- tweeted about this. She's like, maybe somebody could text him the daily child poverty rate and debt servicing costs, right? You can imagine other things here. But it's really important not to confuse centrism or political opinion with what members of Congress think or want, because they're playing a totally different game with totally weird incentives and like they're beholden to totally different folks. Um, But those two things are conflated all the time. Yeah, I mean, I would say that like to me, I think it's a value. I I think you can Unity becomes a kind of, yes, it's like semantics. What is unity? I like, you know, the simple definition, which I've joked about before, is uh, uh, argue from a shared set of facts, uh, treat people with whom you disagree respectfully, don't burn the capital down. Seems like a pretty good uh, set of rules. But what I appreciate about this definition of unity is it doesn't give the power to create it to your opponents. If, if, If bipartisanship is defined as bills passed by the majority and the minority together, you are giving control over unity to people who have a vested interest in not providing you a unity talking point when you run for re-election. Uh, so I think that kind of it it defangs one of their tools, which is to say, uh, if you don't find a way to get me involved, this is partisan forever. It's finding a new definition of that, which I think is very good. Two things I've been thinking a lot about related to that are one, this fetishization of bipartisanship is very peculiarly American. Like if you follow Canadian politics or British politics or German politics, there isn't this idea that legislation is only uh, credible if it has been passed with the governing party and also the opposition party. The job of opposition parties is understood as opposing. And the reason it could be understood that way is that to be in power means you have a governing majority. So you don't need the opposition power party. The opposition party criticizes you and, and tries to convince the public they're right. And the public judges based on results and, and, and these arguments. So that's one thing. This idea of bipartisanship is, is pretty distinctively American. And it comes out of our political institutions, which require very high levels of consensus or at least compromise 
compromise to get anything done. We have a lot of veto points, supermajority requirements, etc. But the other thing that gets to this is there is this horrible fear of what I've come to call like ricochet legislating. And, and not only by by like like bad faith actors. I was just on I was on a TV show with John Tester, the, the Democratic senator from Montana, and I was ranting about the filibuster and he said, well, you know, mm-hmm. The thing that would be really bad for the country is if, you know, Democrats do one thing and the Republicans come in and undo it. And I have exactly the opposite view. For one thing, if Democrats do something the public hates and they elect Republicans to undo it, then Republicans should be able to undo it. Conversely, if you can't actually pass things in the first place, then the public can't really decide they like what you did and keep you in power to do more of it or fix it or tweak it. And so we have in this country, I think, a deeper fear of the costs and consequences of getting things done than of not getting things done. There is a deep preference for the problems of inaction to the problems of action. And I just think that we're wrong about that. I think the problems of inaction, particularly at this point, are worse than the problems of action as long as action is tied to like a reasonable set of um, small d democratic accountability mechanisms. I'd say two things about that. One, it does seem there there is a kind of fear of small d democracy as in If we do these things, we cannot rely on the political system to protect them from these kind of uh, uh, vicissitudes. The other piece of this, which I find striking, is we actually now, because of the of 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 the uh, uh, the sclerotic the way Congress has basically failed to work as an institution, we do now have that ricochet. We have it with executive actions. Yep. We have it with a huge the, the Iran deal. We'll have it with what's we, with with Trump pulling out of the Iran deal. We have it with the Paris Climate Accord. We have it with a host of environmental regulations. We have dreamers it across our government dreamers. So we have we do have that ricochet. And by the way, it is very bad to be governed by ricocheting executive orders that you can't rely on. Like people's lives hang in the balance. But but this is this is this is such an important point. But one thing about the ricochet on executive orders is it's a lot harder to ricochet in Congress. Executive orders are just like one guy with a pen, basically. Whereas I don't believe there is any chance at all that if the Dreamers Act, which had fifty nine votes in the Obama, so I just want to note that fifty nine, it was a big majority for the Dreamers Act. If that had passed, I don't think there is any chance Republicans would have actually legislatively. Um, Uh, repealed it under Trump. Dreamers were popular even among Republicans. Trump even talked as if he supported Dreamers and wanted to use them as part of a compromise. And similarly, also, you know, you get this question from from Democrats on on things like Obamacare. Um, Imagine if Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, had been passed without a filibuster in the first place. So it actually had been a better bill with a public option, better subsidies, better tax structure, I think, and they could have revisited it a number of times along the way. But so, you know, you have a possibly better Obamacare to start, but but even putting that aside, then Republicans come in and let's imagine that like John McCain's thumb had gone the other way and they had actually repealed the Affordable Care Act. It is my view that Americans are not such crap protectors of their own interests that they wouldn't have noticed 15 or 20 million people losing health insurance and had nothing to say about it. One of the things that the way we run the system right now ends up weirdly protecting everybody from is the consequences of their own actions and beliefs. I don't think Republicans would have in the end repealed Obamacare, but if they did, I think they would have paid for it because I think health insurance is actually important to people and taking away things that people have and care about and rely on is really bad politics. And when you practice really bad politics, there are consequences from it. The, the reason I think that it's important to have this conversation is that you actually have to like pull this end back to the, the, the polarization structure. Like everything we're talking about, the reason the filibuster, which has been around for a very long time in American politics and been malign in American politics for a very long time, is so important right now is it has become a tool of polarized parties, not of upset individuals or even of blocks. So for a long time, the filibuster is used by individuals. Then it's used by the Dixiecrats as a Southern bloc to stop civil rights and anti-lynching laws. It's a terrible, terrible history um, for that particular particular uh, bit of senatorial obstruction. But then as the parties polarize, and so they're able to act together in a consistent, unified way, the filibuster becomes a tool of parties. They're trying to make the other party fail at governance, and the filibuster is a way they can. And creating a system where you have zero-sum electoral incentives, and then the party that benefits from, from the other party failing can make the other party fail it's just a really weird way to, to run anything. I always try to tell people when they think about how Congress works to imagine they work in a workplace where they they hate their boss and they think their boss's ideas are bad for like the world. Um, and the only way their boss can get anything done is if they cooperate with him. 
And if they cooperate with him, their boss will get things they hate done and also maybe get a promotion. But if they don't cooperate with him, their boss may get fired and will lose his job. Like, what are you going to do? Like, of course, you're not going to help 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 your boss. Just yesterday, somebody asked Joe Manchin a question. And he shouts, never. I haven't seen what the question was. Abolish the filibuster. If he wants to say never to that, I'm actually fine with that. I'm I heard cool change your mind on the filibuster. Well, see, this is the problem. We got to get we got to start getting very specific. We have to give Joe Manchin the space to, I will never abolish the filibuster. Of course not. I believe in the institution of the Senate. However, these are some modest changes that I think can make things work a little bit better. We got to give him the space for that. But um, do you feel like we're making enough of an argument, not around H.R. 1, not around Republican intransigence, but about the functioning of the Senate itself, that like like cinema, Manchin, you care about this body. If you want the Senate to be powerful, you have to abolish the filibuster. I think that argument is being made aggressively and constantly. Let me let me give you the optimistic version of this and the pessimistic version of this. Exciting. You know how long I've been arguing about the filibuster. Um, mm-hmm. In the Obama era, this was a quirky, idiosyncratic feature of my politics that, as far as I could tell, was shared by like three members of the U.S. Senate. And now, you know, however many years later— It is the majority position of most Democratic senators with like three or four or five holdouts. I mean, we don't know the exact number of holdouts right now, but but we I think it's pretty reasonable to say that if, you know, Democrats had 55 seats in the Senate, it's a pretty good shot. The filibuster would be gone. Um, I think a lot of people believe that. And I do, too. And so this conversation has accelerated in a profound way. The fact that Democrats made H.R. 1, the For the People Act, the first measure of the first bill in House business in 2018, and then Senate, Demo- Senate Democrats did the same with the S1 um, in, in, in 2020, that's a very big deal. So on the one hand, this has moved extraordinarily rapidly. It's a it's an extraordinary victory for this argument that the Senate is broken, and, and Adam Jendelson's kill switch is part of this. And there's a lot more discussion about it. I mean, you guys at, 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 at Crooked have been banging this drum. It's a whole different like discourse than it was 10 years ago. Um, but the issue is that as Democrats get further and further behind the eight ball in the Senate, if they don't take the rare opportunity they have to actually utilize their power and change the underlying rules, they're not going to have another option. So on the one hand, I want to say to you, Look, like we're probably still like five or six years away from this being like a unanimous view among the um, among Democratic senators, but there may not be five or six years, right? So Democrats, right. after Donald Trump just did a horrible job and got wiped out in 2018, and then like you know like wiped out in 2022, they barely got 50 seats there, right? Like they they barely got a Senate a working Senate majority, and that's only with Senator Kamala Harris. Odds are in 2022, they're going to lose seats, right? That's both how the map looks and parties lose seats in midterms. It's very, it's going to be hard for them to build power from here. Not impossible, but very hard for them. So by the time, you know, the last five get to the right answer on this, it may be another 12 years before you can do anything on that. And that means that's another 12 years in which America will not have done nearly enough on climate change, another 12 years in which we will not have done more to to enshrine the right to vote, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I am stunned by how much traction this argument has gotten. I am unbelievably uh, encouraged by that. But the problem is the interaction between like the map and the timing and the argument. You kind of need to do things when you have the power to do them, um, because I think Democrats are likely given, you know, in a world where you where we should, I think, assume the Senate has something between a four to seven point Republican advantage. Democrats just naturally are not going to control the Senate very often, and they're not going to control the Senate very often. Um, they're not going to have many opportunities to, to act on this. So I worry that they're, they're missing an opportunity that's not going to come around for, for some time. But in terms of how much this like new idea of the Senate has taken hold and this idea that the Senate is broken has taken hold, I am stunned by that. I don't, I've rarely seen an argument get this much elite acceptance this rapidly. It does feel as though we have this last period of time where there's we have enough democracy to protect democracy. We have this last chance to do it. What should people be doing? Obviously, everyone listening to this is going to do whatever they can to put pressure on Congress to pass H.R. 1. They, I don't know how many people here are in West Virginia. You have a big and, and Arizona. You have a lot of work to do. Uh, but like, what can people be doing uh, to kind of address these underlying conditions that made our politics so broken? I mean, I think this is this is really hard. Uh, so obviously, people can you know vote for good candidates and can call their senator and can call their member of Congress. Um, I think that 
everybody needs to pay attention to political structure, not just political bills. Like this is a really this is a really important thing. Uh, a litmus test for whether or not somebody is progressive, for instance, has to be that they want to change structures, not just pass good bills. And so being clear eyed about what the blockages in politics are is really important because then you don't get into issues like the filibuster is blocking something and you keep yelling at Joe Biden for not leading hard enough. Uh, like when you misplace blame, you, you get into a lot of trouble. I don't have an answer for how everybody listening to the to this show can like fix politics. But one thing I would say is that in general, going back to something we talked about at the beginning here, one thing that would make a lot of this politics healthier is if people did engage themselves locally. Uh, and that's not yeah. going to change the filibuster in the short term. But one thing that, that really does matter is that politics like redevelop some of these like local identities. It redevelops some of these local polls and people learn how to wield power and political power locally. And there are a lot of people living in places that are not highly democratic listening to this show. And like they have particular um, possibilities to to sort of just change the map. Um, and that's not going to come from like elite national politics, like like beaming messages at people who are otherwise watching Fox News. It's going to come through local organizing. It's going to come through people running for school board and running for mayor. I am just like an endless proponent of people not being too nationalized, of getting involved where they are. I, I say in the book that I grew up in Southern California and we got the you know LA Times and I like cared about local politics and like what I wanted to do with my life was be involved in California politics. And I think now if I were growing up, I was that same kid with the same level of political involvement. I'd be listening to, to Love It or Leave It and Pod Save America and, you know, reading Vox and so on. And my California political identity would be a lot smaller and my nationalized political identity would be a lot bigger. So it is great. Like if you're listening to this show, I hope you listen to, to my podcast, The Ezra Klein Show. But if you're not involved and in reading like local political news, if you don't know who your state representative is, your state senator, like people doing that en masse is actually an achievable thing that would make not just like national politics healthier, but often local politics healthier too. And over time, national politics ends up reflecting local politics. Um, you know, a lot of these folks in Congress, like they came from somewhere and they came out of organizing that happened somewhere. And so like being part of that organizing is is important. Like don't just engage yourself and your, your like mental energy in like the headline collisions in Congress, like actually know what are the fights around you and try to have a, a, an effect on those because you can have a much bigger effect on them. Yeah, that's what I was hoping you would sort of talk about because I did, I, I found that striking, this idea of, you know, if we if we look back on this period and we laugh about how worried we were, it will be because we actually had victories in smaller states, rural places. We actually figured out how to not just kind of, uh, uh, that we that we overcame the anti-democratic qualities in our system, not just by reforming it internally, but by winning electorally in the places we'd have to win to build a durable coalition. And my hope is the combination of this conversation that we're having nationally around the Senate, around the kind of anti-democratic uh, forces in our politics and COVID, which I think has had people look to their local leaders and their functioning of their local government in a way that I don't think they have maybe in their lifetimes. Hopefully one thing that can come out of that is people start paying attention locally where their politics is actually created. Yeah, I would just say that it is also if politics is exhausting and like depressing and depleting for you, like I will say being involved locally with actually people in your community, it's much more affirming, like it's a much healthier, happier way to engage in politics and you learn how to use power. And so that's really that's really meaningful. I mean, just imagine if you don't live in Georgia. Imagine how the people who were involved and we always call it Stacey Abrams effort and Stacey Abrams is amazing and like the work that she did and her groups did is phenomenal. But as she would be the first to say, so many people were involved in that effort, right? So many Georgia like pro-democracy volunteers were out there knocking on doors and talking to people. Imagine how they feel right now. Like look at what they did. Like they organized in Georgia for years and years and like Georgia was a lever they used atop of which they turned the entire country. They saved the country. Like, they saved the country. They saved the country, right? And and they created they a possibility that we're going to do climate legislation the next two years and all these things we're talking about. Like all of that is possible because of the work Georgians did in Georgia. Like it is an incredibly inspiring story. And just, you know, people live in all kinds of places. Like, like 
do that, right? Like yeah. change where you live. It's long, but like at the end, in a way that a lot of us doom scrolling about whatever happened in politics last night or whatever Trump said at CPAC and like, did you see that stupid statue of him? Like can't say like all those people who were doing, you know, what must have seemed many times like kind of hopeless work in Georgia, like the entire country pivoted on their efforts. Like, and that's because they had a lot of power where they lived. They couldn't stop like Donald Trump altogether, but what they could do is change Georgia. And so, yeah, like I'm a big believer in trying to, to re-imbue local politics, not just with, with people, but with like inspiration. Like, I think it's on also people like you and me, right. To like constantly like beat this drum that, um, Politics is not just like the, these headline fights. Like politics is about learning how to wield power where you are. And like, and by the way, even in blue states, like I just wrote this big piece on, on problems in California governance. Like I live in a place that is very blue and where it is not affordable for people with like a normal, like working class job to live. Like it is on me to be involved in trying to change that. Um, there, like you can really change the world through changing like the place you live. Ezra Klein, thank you so much. Uh, it was a great conversation. Really appreciate it. I'm also thinking about that statue at CPAC, and I think it's great because if you had put it in a liberal place, it would have seemed anti-Trump. But if you put it at CPAC, <laughs> it's pro-Trump, which is why I think it might be genuinely great art. Nothing yes, that's right. That. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an iconic piece of our era. <laughs> Ezra Klein, thank you so much. 